this is the UX breakout room, uh, and it's all about like you know how do we do uh, blockchain easier and better. Um, I think I will go quickly through the slides because it's not that complicated. I guess most people will get, will get the problem definitely. Um, so we have obviously. Um, I will start with two statements. Statement one is. I think 2019 is the, the year of Web3 UX. I mean, that's kind of mostly the questions we had so far in the last few, in the last year, in the last few months, was can, how can we make this Web3 easier and better? And um, a lot of, uh, actually, solutions are already tried out, but it doesn't really unify in a very common thing people use and to make it better. The other thing is, I guess, and well, that's my assumption is that next year actually we will see the first applications that will be used by the mainstream where uh, blockchain might not be even in the forefront and this will not be about blockchain it will be about some cool app or some cool thing to do and by the way it also uses blockchain to some degree the big problems we have with blockchain UX or the web 3 UX is uh, maybe actually I should start shortly about my background. Any, everybody knows my background here, or? Okay, who, who does not? Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, quickly, so I actually been part of the Ethereum Foundation uh, since 2015. I joined in January 2015, have built the Mist browser. The newer people have not heard about that, but in fact in the day it was the first Decentralized uh, app browser. We kind of coined that term dApp. Um, the Ethereum wallet uh, was one application within this Mist browser, and I have worked on uh, Web3.js, kind of like the JavaScript library, you, I guess most of you use. Um, that is the library kind of like, you know, we defined like the first way uh, of how you interact with uh, smart contracts and on-chain. Uh, and I guess Web3.js is one of the first tools that made like building on blockchain rather easy and more fun to do, I hope. Um, so my kind of like bigger work, besides like being in the Web3 team since a long time, actually was the 1.0 build, which was recently developed, uh, released. So I have kind of like, you know, came up with this API to make it the way how it is. And I hope it's intuitive. Say yes if it's intuitive. <laughs> or better than before. <laughs> it's an improvement, let's say it's an improvement. Um, um, so, the big problem actually, uh, so okay, there is also uh, ERC20, which I proposed in uh, 2015. Uh, that's kind of like what the, the, the non-tech people know. Um, and also something which I will be speaking today, which is ERC7-5. Um, so big problems for on-chain is obviously, that this is probably the, one of the biggest ones. You want to do a cool app which uses blockchain, and the first thing people encounter is uh, gas. And especially even if you, if, if you even if you come from the blockchain or Bitcoin community, non-Ethereum, you're totally puzzled what that even means. Is gas an extra token? And now with the gas token, actually people think it's a token. So what is gas? And most of the people don't know why they now need something called Ether just to do something in a, in a blockchain-based app. Um, and the other big problem is everything is stored on keys today. So the way of how we interact with the blockchain is we generate a private key or we have a private key in some wallet and this one signs a transaction and we send it to the network. The problem with this is we are dealing here with the lowest level component of how you can interact with a blockchain and we store all our assets and our things on that lowest level uh, tool or access point. By doing that, we run into a few problems. Uh, you have to back them up. You know, you have to actually ask your user to create a very secure backup, which in today's terms means writing down words on paper people don't have. So we force them to make screenshots and store it in iCloud, which is the worst form of safety. Uh, just in case, you know, we have a bit more security. The problem is, um, you know, you make people go through hurdles and complications at the time where they don't even care, you know, or no one know if they ever want to use the app in the first place. So you end up with um, basically a lot of like drops out right in this point in time. Uh, so only the tough one who really like, you know, wants to invest or do something in this app will go through this lengthy process. And you end up with many apps 
many backup keys <laughs> and you somehow have to manage them, you know, don't, don't lose them. Guess what, you know, maybe in case we have some, some value in the future on that. And it actually happened a lot of times. Uh, think of CryptoKitties, you know. Uh, who had thought that this would be worth anything until it did? Um, so ESC 7 to 5 kind of initially was in, in uh, 2017 or something. The idea, okay, how can we make basically an on-chain account, or back then I called it on-chain identity, until the whole identity community like backslashed on me, oh my god, you kind of call it that identity. Uh, and basically to actually unify this whole thing of like how I manage better my account on-chain and how could I have an account which can receive actual information? And this led to the ERC-75 proposal, which was in 2017, October actually, and another thing called 734. It was rather complex, but I think what it did is, for, it was for the first time showing of how can I make a smartphone-based account with some sort of key management logic and some sort of claims I can attach to this account. Um, and it kind of showed the full picture of how can this look like in smart contract language. Uh, it spurred on, it kind of like activated the whole discussion around uh, identity, blockchain, and so on. Even though there were predecessors like Uport and others who did that before me, um, I kind of like proposed this out of the feeling of, of, you know, I had the urge to do it. Like I had also the urge to propose ESC20 in a more public place uh, rather than this wiki page which we had before. Um, and you know, it kind of like was a, the right timing at the time, and it's, uh, it's stirred this discussion. So, out of this came, you know, people say, "Oh, great, there's an identity standard. We should all use it." And the Origin uh, Protocol guys uh, launched the alliance around it, and then we had a Telegram channel, and a lot of people joined this alliance, and kind of everybody like um, uh, cuddled around the standard, <laughs> um, but not really developed it further or actually started to use it. So one thing is having a standard, the other thing is having an alliance for a standard, but the actually important thing is having people use it, you know, and make sense of it. Um, there are also problems, especially with the earlier version of 7 to 5, is that it's very complex. And it is very specific also in how you do key management and how you do certain things. And that kind of led a little bit to, uh, I would say, um, uh, a stifled uh, progress or, or a speed of, of like adopting it. So uh, we had some discussions with people there and we came up with ESS 7 to 5. Actually, Taylor came uh, to me and said, hey, here, I have some ideas and let's talk about it. Um, and that kind of led to the ESC 7 version 5, uh, version, uh, version 2. Um, and the interesting thing about this, it completely made it simple. <laughs> and I think, you know, one, if, if one thing is, is key to success for a standard, it is simplicity. So ESC20 was kind of the reason of why it was simple um, to use and uh, ESC20 and ESC75 version 2, in my opinion, is also key of why uh, it could be very successful because it's so simple. So in, in effect of what does it do, does, you know, it's like, okay, this is a smart contract which has an owner and there's like some, some key value store in there and there's a generic execute function. So it's actually not a lot of things. Um, the execute function is actually important, you know, because that allows you to do a lot of things on the blockchain. Um, so, but in its core essence, what is ERC 7 to 5? And not to forget, there is more to standardize on top of that, so this is not the, it's not the all-in-one golden solution. But it is a very key piece, because it is the core piece uh, of a on-chain account. So basically, we store everything currently on keys. If we replace this by a smart contract based account, we can add a few properties which we didn't have before. And one is obviously, I can use my account from different places, which is exactly right now the problem. So we all end up having MetaMask, maybe having some Ledger, maybe having some other five apps. And what happens, we all use different accounts and all of them have different amounts of Ether or assets on all of them. And some we don't even know that anymore that we have. And uh, we tend to basically not use our um, on-chain accounts often, right? You basically have one account per app, which um, 
can be useful, but can be very hard to manage, especially when it comes around uh, dealing with like different type of uh, games or like just wanting to access your your account in different places. So the smart contract based account basically allows you to manage it because it has this owner address. So owner means that there's one address that can control this uh, account, and this uh, one address could obviously be a simple key. It could be a very simple. A private key, which could be even the first one you generate in your application. So think of, application starts, it generates a key under the hood, this key does not need to be safe because it is a throwaway key you just use initially and the moment you get more value to it, um, you can make it more secure. So could, you could even think of taking this key and send it via email as a backup process so that in case you like, lose the app or the phone in the next few days, you can easily reinstantiate your previous account. I mean, if we think about it, we use email today for resource setting our password all the time, right? That's our security measure we have. So email is, you know, if you have access to emails, you have access to everybody's accounts. The email is the username and the way to reset the password. That's already a funny thing. Um, so that's the security measure we have. So why not sending a private key or some kind of generated link or so directly to this email? The moment you get actually value on your account or you use it more often for something, then you can actually attach a multisig and have that multisig being the controller of the account. And that multisig could be a Gnosis safe. Uh, it could be um, a complex permission contract that allows certain parties to do certain things through this 7 to 5 account and others not. So think of like you are a company and the 7 to 5 is your company's official address. If you have a permission contract where the intern can actually talk through the official address but only can talk to certain accounts or certain uh, smart contracts and call only certain functions, you can have your intern use the official account without any kind of uh, security loss. Or it could be just a simple multisig. Or on top of this, this, this allows also social recovery schemes and whatever else because whatever we come up with better ways of managing keys, we can attach to the same existing account or to multiple of those. The important thing also is we can have uh, meta transactions. We can use the gas station network or other relay services within those uh, key manager accounts and suddenly uh, completely hide the fact that there is a, a fee to be paid. The future of blockchain should be the way of how the Web2 works today, meaning the application developers or the company who does it should build the um, should pay for uh, the, the usage at least to some degree until there's a way to, to to recoup the payment. I mean, today nobody is paying for servers of applications; and still, we just download them and use them all the time. It should be the same with Web three. Um, the relay transaction service is actually the key piece to make it easy, but. This allows a lot more things. So this, in, in, in the first instance, creates a manageable account. So now I on, not only have one key, but I have a key or an account that I ha can manage in all kinds of ways. And you know, we can invent a lot of new things of how we manage those. But I can also attach information to it, and that's what this uh, key value store is for. So the key value store is byte 32 and bytes as value. This means we can come up with all kinds of things that we allow to be attached to such an account. And this can be uh, completely random things of links to reputation systems or whatever. I mean, for example, you could simply attach an avatar to this account uh, to make it somewhat uh, cool and identifiable, or a, the company's logo or whatever. But you can also link to all kinds of other uh, off-chain more identifiable data that you don't want to reveal on chain but it somehow should be referenced and linked to this public identity or this public account you have here and whatever we come up with you know batches reputation systems linked tokens whatever I mean you can just on this address have a lot of uh, NFT sitting or um, batches whatever but you can also link uh, to a extra reputation system sitting in another smart contract that allows a lot of flexibility, and because there's so many more things, we don't know what is coming, 
having a key value store really allows for all kind of new things. You know, we don't need to think about everything right now. And having defined these five things you can do on a on an uh, on chain account, it's an open ended system. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> um, so that actually creates a manageable, verifiable account. So using this as the default, and the beauty here is you can start out with a key in your application. The moment somebody purchases something or does an action which somehow uh, creates value or uh, money spent, you can on the fly just create an account for him where this key is the owner. The beauty is that now this person could actually take this account and take it into another application. So if we all start to use the same default account standard, you can take your account across all of these different applications and it's a lot more manageable and it's a lot more easy to interact with on-chain things. So that can be rather cheap to deploy. I mean, uh, Ether transactions 21,000 gas, 32,000 for uh, deploying a library. That can be as cheap as it can get. And it's basically, it could be a long-lasting manageable account. And because it's a smart contract, and smart contracts can talk to other smart contracts, that's the big, big magic thing, which I guess a lot of people outside of the Ethereum space has not, have not fully understood. Why Ethereum is awesome, uh, and the EVM, in fact, is because of that fact that you can talk to other smart contracts. That kind of makes your uh, on-chain account the actor on chain. This means for other systems outside, it's the same like before. You know, if a key is talking to you or a smart contract, you don't care. In fact, here you can even check the smart contract, re uh, read some information you need, maybe some verification or maybe some attached claims you somehow need, um, and do something with them. So, message sender, you know, that's what all, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be your person. This could be one account you use. You can have 50 if you want to. I guess we end up with just a few. Um, but you can use them for different personas. Uh, you don't necessarily need to uh, upload your picture and then go to the government and put a proof on your on-chain account and just to prove that this is your account and then go everybody, show everybody what you do. But one of the biggest pieces in our society is actually transparency. We are on Twitter and on Facebook and all of these platforms because we want to express ourselves. So that expression needs a uh, identity you can actually, or an account you can actually take around, um, where, where, which you create, right? You can take care that whatever is on there is what you really want to uh, put out there. And um, 7 to 5 can be that. Also for companies, also for organizations. Technically speaking, the Ethereum Foundation should have a 7 to 5 account and not the Ethereum uh, multisig from three years ago being in the official address, uh, which we all look at, right? So it's your on chain account and it should be your gateway to the decentralized world. And if you want to do identity, then you rather look into off chain solutions like verifiable claims. W3C does great work on that, and there's a lot of uh, projects like uh, 3Box and IDEN3 and Uport and Yolocon, which are working on making these kind of like real world identities work, which are not necessarily on the blockchain or only have like slight pieces on the blockchain. So, what we have done is there is the ESA 725 Alliance, obviously, that's uh, there is the official or the current implementation of the 725 uh, version 2 as well. There's always an issue where we discussed, discussed um, currently the main thing we are doing, um, laser, uh, doesn't work on the screen. So the standard scenario, so I'm working on this project, Luxo. So this is a blockchain for the uh, new creative economies, how we call it, or for the lifestyle space. One important thing here is this is a crowd of people who does not know tech, nor want to understand blockchain, but they might want to create tokens or own things physically and digital. So you need to make it easy for them to interact with the blockchain. So we are developing and iterating on standard scenarios, means like different standards, like 7 to 5, like digital certificates and others. Um, we are kind of like trying things out, you know, how this could work in a whole flow together, how it can own token. There's a new standard we proposed, um, which is the lowest one. It's actually a universal receiver standard. That probably is a whole discussion itself, but we have, uh, in very short, we have this problem of many tokens implementing different type of receiver functions. So 7.7 has token received, ESC 223 has 
I think, also something with token fallback function or whatever they call it. So everybody has different function names. If I want to have a generic a, a account like in 75, I run into the problem that I, had, that I have to implement at least like five different functions to receive different type of tokens or NFTs. If we use a universal receiver, basically one common function name that has a type and some data you pass with it, you can uh, be able, you are able to receive everything, even future assets, because you could upgrade either this part that receives stuff, or just let your interface deal with whatever you received. So the universal receiver is a very incremental piece in an on-chain account, for example, and that's something we propose in our standards repository, we call it Luxo Standards Process, LSP, so that's very much like uh, the EIP repository, just that it's, oh no, I stepped on Oh, your password. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the only difference is that it's um, a it's the blockchain around this lifestyle arena, so we can discuss in a more calm space, and, and uh, it's not already so to totally busy uh, with a lot of co competing standards. We are in the standards war, you know. Everybody has the better standards, and we don't talk anymore about. Uh, more complex interaction models. And the thing about the standard scenario and also the LSPs we promote, promote here is that we think not only about the individual standards, but how this works in concert. You know, how can I make sure that I can easily read a portfolio of a given address? Um, how tokens interact with identities, how identities can receive, for example, different tokens, including future ones. So there's a lot of things we should think more about how stuff works together, and not just everybody comes up with their standard and now we have one little more building block, but uh, five of them, you know, and then they all don't work together and accounts reading token, for example, is super complicated, totally hacky. Um, so we want to have composability, means we need standards that kind of fit together. There's already a question here, <laughs> please. So, uh, go ahead. It's just the idea for the RCC to verify that we get uh, real world applications of it and we post it as a counties and then like people solve the technical problem to like help in the real world thing. And the other thing I'm asking about what about doing a library? I don't know how it's going to be to have an easy injection in the smart contract, but it's way like you can simply when you use this PT you are going to have verification in a centralized Made in service, like to made verification. I don't know how certification. Do you know? Verification. Yeah. So how could be like maybe one of us can start working on it to have a decentralized verification. I did get more level of security. So what is the I mean uh, you're talking about for example accessing your on-chain account. Um, so it's being automatic like I I just put this interface in this contract and I have I used the library, so it's implemented with the signals. <coughs> so basically, libraries for smart contracts. I mean, Open Zeppelin is kind of like the biggest library for uh, standardized smart contracts we have. I don't really understand the question. Uh, is this something like an open source? Uh, I mean, Open Zeppelin is kind of open source, but. Um, uh, you, you're talking about like how can other people contribute with different pieces, or how do you have a... How we are going to have like verification in, to be like doing email verification using one line of code. Like I want my, my ERC-725 to have email verification. Yeah. So I just uh, like add it, and, like we are going to execute, we are going to add level of verification at this email. Okay, um, so if you want to uh, kind of like attach information like this, it obviously belongs into the set data, uh, the key value store. Um, if you want to have email verification, um, you always have to think about, okay, okay this is your on-chain account, so you, you have to te teach your user of what they should and shouldn't do. I mean, uh, for example, through interfaces, we know that when we post something on Instagram, it's pretty public, so people are not posting their private uh, naked pictures. Um, so here we have to treat it the same. You're posting it on chain, so it could or potentially be read by people. So also making sure that what you put, like that, this is a public persona you're creating here versus maybe your private persona. If you want to verify your email address, then I guess there's a service which should verify that. Um, 
using And you could simply attach uh, a signed message into one of the key value store, which says, okay, we checked the email, and that's yeah, the email. Yeah, that's what we would do. I mean, either this, or there's some kind of like registry, which does like a verification, for example, your service could have an extra smart contact with just verification, and then in the key value store, you simply link to that registry. That could be another way. So the beauty of this key value store is it can contain data on its own, but it could be also simply referencing other places to go look. And if we standardize these processes, we exactly know uh, what to do. You know, and as each key value store we define can be very different, we can come up with a lot of cool things to build on top of an on-chain account. That's the beauty of it. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question. Um, so before you're talking about using 734 to act as a controller contract and 725 as a proxy contract. But yeah. this presentation, you're more saying, okay, we can use, like, say, Nosis 6. Yes. But I guess my question would be, what would be the advantage of using 725 instead of just having Nosis 6 be both the proxy and the controller contract, which is still on chain? Because you can upgrade, uh, upgrade. Your, your key management. But you could also upgrade the Nosis 6. I mean, you can build it, it that it's all in one contract. For example, the owner address could be itself. You could make an up. I mean, actually, uh, Hadrian from Kitsune Wallet build exactly a 7 to 5 uh, upgradable contract where you basically have one address which contains the key value store and owner and then additional like management keys uh, systems. You can build it as well. Um, on the end, your wallet only needs, or your interface only needs to know that's the address, that's the owner, either it's the same address or it's a different address, and then it has to look up what standard this is, you know, what kind of key manager thing it is, so you can deal with that as well, and then you can interact with this account. Uh, in the simplest form, it's just a key, you know, which you have in your wallet. But yeah, could be in the same account. I think uh, keeping it separate makes a lot of sense because uh, what I see is happening is you have and I know the time is up, and, and just to, to keep this short. This permanent account, 7 to 5, is probably something we want to keep for a while and use it in my, maybe some games or whatever else. So it's a permanent thing we want to be secure. The key manager is maybe something we can upgrade over time. So having this in a separate smart contract uh, keeps the risk lower. For example, the universal receiver contract, the contract which knows how to deal with stuff you receive, should also be a separate module because I assume uh, people will upgrade that very frequently. And if you all pack it into one account, then suddenly all of this code can write into the same slots, potentially overriding all of the important stuff you have in there. So keeping this in separate addresses, which cannot really do things on the other side, uh, makes it more safe. I mean, I, as I assume there will be a future where people go to a website and say, hey, download this new universal receiver or contract because now it's called blah, 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 blah. And then you just go ahead and upgrade your, your account with this. And uh, if this would be the same account, it could maybe just move your assets around or you know, overwrite your storage values. Like this, it's, the worst thing you can do is notify your interface wrong, with a wrong uh, lock or something like this. Cool. I think that's it. Time is up. Thank you so much.